here somewhere. You're cold it today. I see her. <laughs> so prayer request number one: pray for Mike and his hearts towards his wife. <laughs> pray for Mike, absolutely. Um, other prayer requests that we might have. Oh, okay. Super nervous, anxious about it. Sure. Yeah. Is that her? Is the first time she's ever had any kind of? No, she had her tonsils again like years ago, but she hmm. did not do well with the anesthetic. So. Okay. Sure. But you're not a little bit older and right. Later and right. Okay. So that's this Friday, you said. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Marty, I didn't recognize you at first. <laughs> All cleaned up. <laughs> She's standing there talking to Doris. Oh, I yeah. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we we do rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, the great salvation we have in him <clears throat> so mercifully and graciously given to us and we do lift up uh, Amy Lynn and the procedure coming up on Friday and we just ask that uh, you would uh, shepherd her through that help her to be uh, trusting you and we pray for whatever the procedure is and whoever is performing it Lord that you just guide and, and direct them and uh, we think also of <clears throat> those who may be traveling in right now we ask that you give them safety as they travel and we pray for all the other teachers as they teach that you would just fill them with your wisdom your word uh, and give us hearts to joyfully receive it and we just pray all this in jesus name amen <clears throat> so page 11 like i said last week we wrapped up worship <clears throat> Uh, we're talking about the nature of the church, what makes the church the church. And so, yeah, last week was, was worship. <clears throat> Morning, Karen. It's I mean, I, I knew they didn't have to say that. I knew that. That's, that's just like, we just assumed that. <laughs> yeah, it's quickly becoming one. Dwight. If you want a marriage class, I'm okay with it. She was looking at you, though, Dwight, when she said it. We all know it's her fault. Oh, you're supposed to go to the girls' class. I think you were in Bill's class last week, but it's it's your call. Yeah. Don't worry, I'll take it personally. That happened when I was in school, too. I still have nightmares about that. <laughs> Okay, so instruction is the second part about uh, the purpose of the local church. Again, last week was worship, which olden days, if you remember, they used to pronounce worth-ship. Yep, cause just to show that he's, he's worthy. Um, so now we'll talk instruction. And I'm going to be trying to write these things on the board, too, for anyone who's watching online. So under instruction is uh, the responsibility to deliver instruction. Responsibility to deliver and for that we're looking at 2 Timothy 2.15 through five. Welcome, ghouls. <clears throat> My favorite student is here, Clara, with a bird. A different bird every time. Uh, someone could read 2 Timothy 2.15, and someone else, please read 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. And I don't have the notes in front of me. Are there questions in your notes? I can't remember if I put those in there or not. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so who has Second Timothy 2.15? I do. All right. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has, not, has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the 
Yeah, so clearly all, all believers should seek to do what that verse says, doing our best to handle God's word. Uh, but that's, that's a direct uh, uh, word to Timothy as, as the teacher, the elder of the church, uh, to handle God's word well. Then chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, pretty, pretty strong language here from Paul. Nice. Yeah, that's, that's quite the charge, huh? Well, so as you guys think about those verses and look at those verses, just a couple of questions there in the notes. Um, what, what, what do these verses say will result in the life of a pastor if he does not work hard? What will result if he does work hard? What are, what are some thoughts that, that come to your mind? Lead people yeah, lead people astray. That's... That's pretty scary. We'll be judged. We'll be judged. Yeah, yeah. Like with verse one, right? With Second Timothy four, I charge you in the presence of God. Yeah. Anything else? Those are good thoughts. Chapter two, it says, uh, in doing these things, um, be proof God is working. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There was a, I just forgot which Puritan it was, but there was a Puritan who had engraved on his desk the words, mind your own business. And what he meant by that was, if I remember right, he either had that verse, second, the Second Timothy 1 or the Second Timothy 4 1, um, Second Timothy 2 or Second Timothy 4, right next to it. And that just that idea of your business as a minister of the Word of God is the scripture. Mind your business. I thought that was pretty good. Just a constant reminder <clears throat> to be in the Word. Well, the second one is the responsibility to receive. And for that, I think I have James, right? James 1. through 25. And also 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. So we're right there in 2 Timothy. And that's a familiar passage to us. I'll, I'll read it. It says, All scripture is breathed out by God. And profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And then uh, if we all want to turn to the James passage, <clears throat> James chapter 1, 22 through 25. And I'm actually I'm going to pick that up in verse 19. I think I think the context there is quite important. So James James 1, verse 19 <clears throat> says, "Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God." Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. 
for he looks at himself and goes away at once, forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Uh, so same, same kind of questions. What are some things that jump out at you, especially in that James passage, as it talks about the importance of listening to truth, and more than just listening, right? Obeying. What, what are some things that hit you? Well, even the end as it relates to the beginning, you have to be quick to hear other people. Yeah. Yeah. So that's part of our doing. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> What else? It's a quiet crowd this morning. <clears throat> so what does it say? Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say the, the word is perfect and we are not, so we should shut up. There we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm just going to make a little note here. <laughs> but when that brings it up, it's like we had the part of the doing is putting aside the filthiness, putting aside yes. the things that the world yeah. seems valuable and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. talks about. Yeah. yeah and, and in its place, replacing it with the word. Huh? Yeah, verse 21. I, always hits me. Um, sometimes we're so full of the filth and wickedness that there's no place for the Word of God to go in us. We need to purge. Welcome, Terry. We are on page 11, I believe. <clears throat> 12. Are we on 12 now? Okay. <clears throat> yep, number two, under, under instruction. <clears throat> okay, so the purpose, we'll move to that one. Oops, that was some bad writing right there. The purpose of instruction, we're looking at Ephesians 4, uh, 12 through 17 or 16, somewhere around there. Okay. Uh, so Ephesians 4 is a passage that I love. Um, it's my conviction that, that verses 12 through 16, yeah, I should say 16, are, are the blueprint for the local church. It has a lot to say uh, concerning the life of the local church, but, but here we're just kind of thinking about the purpose of instruction. Um, so verse 11, God's given gifts to the church. In particular, those gifts are uh, people gifted with the word, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. And the reason why is verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, <clears throat> until we all attain to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Why? So that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Um, so, first question underneath that, what, what should happen as a result of the instruction we receive from God's Word, according to verse 12? Okay, that's from, are you getting that from verse 12, or are you getting that from verse 15? Oh, 16, oh yeah, it works, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, we grow in love. <clears throat> back, <clears throat> back up from that. How is it that we grow in love? What needs to happen first? Oh, we got to like work together. 
Yeah, we work together. Yeah, what did you, did you say sharing our gifts? Yeah, like each part has, it says each part has or does its own special work. So like, yeah, yeah. Helping each other do that. Nice. Um, so yeah, as we all use use our gifts and as we speak the truth and love to one another uh, the, and do our part, then the church grows itself up, builds itself up in love. Um, <clears throat> so back to verse 12, the, the key phrase where it says, to equip the saints, right? Um, that word equip is a fascinating word. Um, Outside of the New Testament, it's, it's found in, in a lot of medical documents, especially for when the, a bone is broken and you reset the bone. Um, the bone is equipped or it's mended or it's fixed. Um, <clears throat> it's also used uh, back in, uh, I can't remember where, in the Gospels where, but if you remember when Jesus comes up on a couple of the disciples and they're mending their nets, remember that? Um, it's the same word for mending and equipping is the same word and the idea is it's worn it's frayed it's tattered and so God gives to the church verse 11 of those who teach God's word and as they teach God's word we who are imperfect right are perfected by it we're strengthened by it we're mended we're repaired we're restored so that we can do what what's the say in verse 12 yeah, build the body of Christ, right? To do the work of the ministry. Um, and as, as we're all engaged, equipped, um, the church is able to do what, it, what it's called to do. Um, is there another question I had in there? Yeah, okay, so what about, what are some pitfall, pitfalls that will be avoided if we receive this instruction according to verse 14? Yeah. Yeah, we're not led astray. Yeah, we're anchored. So yeah, we're we're united. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite the imagery. I'm tossed to and fro by every wind and wave of doctrine. It's just another word for teaching, right? There's lots lots of teaching out there. Easy to be tossed around by it. <clears throat> Nice. Any other thoughts before we move on to the next one? Welcome, Don. <clears throat> so next is fellowship, right? Does anyone know the, the common Greek word for fellowship? What are you laughing about? What's, oh, you're... I see. Okay. <laughs> I thought you were, yeah. <laughs> koinonia. Yep, koinonia. Oops. <clears throat> That's terrible, Henry. So koinonia is the common word in the New Testament for fellowship. You find that a lot in First John. You also find that a lot in Philippians. The Philippians one is interesting because where's Paul? He's in prison, yeah. And he talks a lot about his partnership, his oneness, his fellowship uh, with his brothers and sisters in Christ. So for fellowship, I just have a, a couple of illustrations. Uh, maybe you've heard these before. The first one's fairly common. Uh, it's commonly referred to as the silent sermon. And so uh, there's a pastor of a church, and uh, a per certain person has been absent for quite a few weeks. And so the pastor um, takes it upon himself to go and, and visit with this individual and uh, walks in, says hi, that's about all he says, and they sit down, there's a good fireplace going, and so they both just sit there and stare at the fire for a while. And after a little bit of just staring at the fire, uh, the pastor grabs those, the tongs, right, and pulls out one of the hot burning coals and just puts it on the hearth. And 
they still just sit there. And this is what I'm saying. They sit there and they, they watch. They watch that coal, and that coal goes from really hot to ashen gray, right? Just it starts to cool. Um, and then at some point, eventually, the pastor looks at his watch and says, "You know what? I gotta go." Uh, before he goes, he picks up that coal again and puts it back in the fire, and that coal starts to turn super hot again, right? And before the pastor makes it to the door, uh, the other guy says, thanks for the sermon, Pastor. I'll see you at church this Sunday. That's pretty good. Just, just the analogy of how we need each other uh, to burn white hot for Christ. And when we separate ourselves apart from the life of the body, um, we start to cool. And it's imperceptible at first, I'm sure. Um, I, I think I've shared the story before of when we lived in Pennsylvania while I was in college and in seminary then too. Yes, it took me like 20 years to get through seminary. That's how slow I am. <laughs> um, but little by little, plugging plug away there. And while we're there, it's called Wayside Gospel Chapel. Um, <clears throat> just a small little uh, chapel off, off the beaten path. Uh, but it was, it was fun, to, fun to be there. But the, one of the deacons... Um, who now is a pastor and pastors in a church in Lake Ariel, PA, that is, no joking, standing room only, like every week. Like, it's, it's jam-packed. The Lord's really blessed that man. He, he always was very, very gifted. Uh, but <clears throat> there's a point in his life when Valerie and I are ministering there, and Pastor Jack is away because he's, he's Army Reserve, so he gets called over to Iraq. So I'm in seminary, and the church decides, well, he, he's training to be in the ministry. Shouldn't we just call him? So that's what happened. <laughs> um, so I'm working two jobs, uh, two, two part-time jobs. Um, well, one part-time, UPS, that's a 30-hour job. And then I'm working for my brother, it's another 20, 25-hour job. We're married for what at that point, like a year maybe? So Lexi's, Lex, no, we're not even married that long. We're, we're pretty newly wed. I'm in seminary and I'm pastoring a church. Can you say, <laughs> just stupid, right? Um, but by the grace of God, I even make my way through that as I think through it as I go, my word. Um, but during that time, the other deacon and I, we took turns once a month. We'd, we'd take turns preaching just to ease the burden. And <clears throat> the deacon, his name was Bill. Um, he, he misses a Sunday. No biggie. He missed Sundays, right? Occasionally here and there. Um, Next Sunday, he misses another Sunday. Next Sunday, he's not there again. <laughs> um, the next Sunday, he's supposed to preach. You still haven't heard or seen from him. Um, and I forget exactly how, how it all works, but he misses like four or five, six Sundays. Um, and I'm having a hard time getting a hold of him. Eventually, I do, and it's kind of like, what's up? And um, <clears throat> he, he just basically, I mean, this guy is working insane hours, too. He's, he's a Mason guy in masonry, is what I mean. And so he was easily pushing 70 hours a week. And that masonry is pretty brutal work. Um, so he works like 10, 12 hours every day, Monday through Saturday. And Sunday is his only day, right? And so one Sunday, I can't remember, I think he was sick. The next Sunday he had already planned to do a bike ride down to Sturgis, um, <clears throat> the big rally that happens down there. Another Sunday, but yeah, so then what happens is by that second time he misses the church, the third Sunday is coming around and he's thinking, you know what? It's kind of nice having this day where I can stay home and I, I don't go to church and I can just do my thing and it starts to feel really good. And he, he, he comes back eventually and he just admits, he confesses how he was starting to slip spiritually and how that just kind of happened gradually. And um, so, so to me, whenever I think of that analogy of the... Uh, the coal, taking the coal out, that, that was him. And the Lord was gracious to him and brought him back. And, and like I said, he's, the Lord's really using him mightily right now. Um, but I, I think that illustrates well the importance of fellowship. Um, another illustration is if you ever have watched National Geographic and watched, or maybe as a clip on YouTube or on wherever, social media or something, and you see how lions attack their prey, you ever see how they do that? Especially if there's 
like a big gang of whatever, let's just say, what, what's a common prey I'm trying to picture? Like a gaz gazelles, right? So let's say there's like a big, whatever a herd of gazelles are called, probably not a herd. Um, <clears throat> and so what the lions do, there usually be one or two lions, and initially they kind of attack the herd, but what they work to do really hard is, is break one or two gazelles off from the rest of the flock, right? And in doing that, those gazelles are very susceptible. <clears throat> and they can take them out one on one on one on one, one, right? So scripture very uh, powerfully calls Satan a what? Roaring lion. Roaring lion, right? And I think he works to do that. He works to get us um, separated from the flock um, of, of the church and isolate us. And when, when we get isolated, we get stuck in our own thoughts, in our own way of doing things, and we we fade. Isn't there a song? As I'm thinking about that. Like, is that Casting Crowns? Yeah. The slow fade or something? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so those, those are just a couple illustrations to show the importance of fellowship. Um, I think there's nowhere more, more vulnerable to the child of God than, than being all, all alone. Remember also all the one another's. Um, you and I cannot demonstrate love or joy or peace or patience by sitting all by ourselves. We demonstrate those things and we have committed to loving people who give us good reasons not to love them. Right? Love is easy to talk about until you commit yourself uh, to a marital relationship <laughs> or you commit yourselves to a church relationship and all of a sudden, people give you a lot of good reasons not to love them, right? I give my wife very good reasons constantly not to love me. I would say she does the same too, but she's in this room, so. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's, that's the importance of those one and others. It's easy to talk about forgiveness until you have to do what? You have to forgive them, right? And so all these one and others imply uh, fellowship that implies that we're in the life of the body um, and that we are sacrificing for one another and humbling ourselves uh, loving loving one another any thoughts or questions about fellowship if not um, service is another key one, but I have a whole lesson devoted to that, so we just kind of skip over that one. Um, so the one after service is evangelism. <clears throat> okay, so what comes to your guys' minds when you hear the word evangelism? Good or bad? What comes to your minds? The gospel. The gospel? Okay. So what is the gospel? Who can share the gospel with us? 30 seconds or less, what's the gospel? Say it again. Okay. Yeah, specifically death for our sin. Yeah, the burial, resurrection. Nice. Yeah, so we think the gospel, that's good. Um, what about the gospel? What, what's Romans 1.16 say about the gospel? Nice. <clears throat> How about I write some of these things down that you guys say? So, gospel, Romans 1 16. Can you say that again so everyone hears you, Val? It's the power of God unto salvation. Yeah, uh, so the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Not how winsomely I say it, right? Um, now, how's that saying go? There's an old saying again for the Puritans, something like, you can, you can preach the gospel better than I can, but you can never preach a better gospel. But that's, that's the idea, right? That the gospel is the power of God, and so therefore, we're not ashamed of it. Um, the other passage that Don quoted, kind of, is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 3. That's where Paul says, I, I want to share with you what's of first importance, that Christ died for our sins. And he, three days later, rose from, he, 
rose from the dead. <clears throat> Anything else come to your mind with the word gospel? Any other passages? Romans 10, where it says, Gather yes. Gathered believed in the heart and spoke with mouth. Yeah. Yeah, faith comes by hearing. Nice. So what else for evangelism? Gospel is good. We need to, um, obviously from Romans 1.16, we need to verbally proclaim it. That would, that would teach the same thing too, Romans 10. 1 Corinthians 15 is kind of the content, right? The content of the gospel. If you guys can read that writing. What else for evangelism? How do we evangelize? I feel like there's this idea that it has to be um, like Ray Comfort or it has to be like street preaching kind of thing. Okay. Is what is a fear that's created in a lot of us. Like it, if you're not, if you're not evangelizing, if you're not doing that. But I appreciate when you're talking about like investing and building relationships with people because it happens every day. <laughs> right. Uh, with the people all around us. Right. Yeah. So. Are we all familiar with Ray Comfort? Ray Comfort is, is he, I think it's called Living Waters Ministry. He's developed this whole evangelistic method called the Master's Way, where he literally goes, to, he goes on the streets of pretty big cities and will walk through, um, like, basically the Ten Commandments without them knowing that he's going through the Ten Commandments. And he'll kind of ask them um, if they think they're a good person. And by the time he's done, he's pretty amazing at it. Because some of the things he says could really be taken offensively. <laughs> but the videos you see, I mean, he walks up to, like, this one, like, there's this one video. I mean, this guy has, like, a mohawk. Like, I mean, like, going this high up. And has spikes, yeah. <laughs> and it's a guy most of us intimidated. He doesn't bat an eye. And by the time he's done, he has that guy admitting that he's not such a great guy who initially thought he was. Um, whether it comes to faith, I don't know. But it's, it's just, it's a way of using the, God, the, the law to help people see they're, they're sinful. Then he points them to Christ. So it's called the Master's Way. There's a whole course for it, I believe. Yeah, you can look it up on YouTube or... Yeah. But it's, it's kind of fun to watch, isn't it? <laughs> he is very fun to watch. Yeah. He's, he's very, very good. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so street preaching is, is often, I, I think that's right, what comes to people's minds. Um, I think what often comes to other people's minds, too, is I have to memorize the Romans road, and I have to walk through <clears throat> all these verses with them, or I haven't shared the gospel. So, so what I'd like to emphasize is that evangel evangelism is, is God speaking through your personality. Um, so God wired us all differently, and you could also throw in your gifts there. There's one other word I want to add. So I'm wired differently than you guys. You guys are all wired, wired differently from one another, right? You're all a snowflake, right? Um, <clears throat> so the way I evangelize, the method is going to be different than how you guys do it. And that's the beauty of the body of Christ. And so it's not, so often what we do is memorize, memorize this gospel presentation, whatever it is, the master's way, the Romans road, the ABCs of salvation. I mean, there's, there's tons of them, right? And so we think that we have to do it that way. Whereas in reality, I, I think the best way to do it is, is to recognize your personality and your gifts. Your, your gift might be hospitality, where you just love to have people come to your house and put on a cup of coffee for them or make a meal for them and then just sit down and talk with them and get to know them. And as, as you do so, as you have opportunity, you weave this in and out of the conversation, right? The gospel. And that is a very effective method because that's based on your personality and your gifting. For others, it might be like Ray Comfort who goes on the street and does what he does, or if I did that, I'd fall on my face and people would want to probably kill me. 
right? <clears throat> Just because how poorly I do it. Um, <clears throat> it's it's going to vary constantly. And I, I think this is key, too, that it's, that it's teamwork. That it's, it's, that I think we, we often think evangelism is like a solo sport. Whereas if we could see it as, as a ministry of the body, where we're all working together. So, so like maybe, I'm trying to think of a way to illustrate it. Maybe I have a friend uh, who I've, I've been uh, sharing the gospel with over the period of a couple months. And I find out that they really like something that Marty likes. And so I find ways to bring Marty into that conversation or into our life and connect with Marty, right? And as that happens, we find out that this guy's wife has, has a real love for something that Don really loves, right? And maybe eventually they come to church. And while they're at church, they meet other people and they see it in action and they hear it. And <clears throat> through the work of, of many of us together, um, they come to faith in Christ. And by the way, evangelism is a lot easier when you have other people helping you too. It's a lot more fun um, and not as intimidating. <clears throat> Does that make some sense? Any other thoughts on, on evangelism? I mean, there's, there's a lot we could say there. But th the key is... I don't, it, some people call it lifestyle evangelism. The only, the only danger with that is, is you, you need to do this. You need to share the gospel with them. It's not just a matter of um, building relationships, as valuable as that is. There needs to be the gospel verbally proclaimed, right? Because faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of Christ. <clears throat> so yeah, we encourage, we talked about these before, the four eyes. So the first the first I is identify. We ask that everyone identifies two or three loved ones in their life uh, who they, as far as they can tell, are without faith in Christ. And having identified them, the next one is you intercede for them. You pray for them daily. You pray for them regularly. Um, you pray a whole host of different things for them. And having interceded for them, you're simultaneously investing in their life. You're getting to know them. You're rubbing shoulders with them. Um, you're hanging out with them. Um, all for the purpose of the fourth eye of inviting. You invite them to faith in Christ. You share the gospel with them, uh, trusting that they will... Turn from their sin and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Any other thoughts or comments about evangelism? If not, yes. Um, you had made a comment that evangelism wasn't, it was not to be done alone because it, it, it was a, a teamwork. Mm -hmm. Right, it is. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, so I, so I don't really understand how it became like this individual thing. Um, in fact, what really drives me nuts is when people kind of start bragging about it. You know, I was once at a at a conference and I can't remember if I got up and walked out or if I almost did. Bill was there with me, and this guy just like went on and on and on and on about. It's almost like notches on his belt, you know, like all these people he led to faith in Christ. And it's like, one, you didn't do that at all. God did that. <laughs> um, and God was gracious to you to, to work through that. But, yeah, it, it, it's almost become this proudful thing for, for some people. And that's the other thing that I, I would like to add is that um, I have a friend just last week who said, oh, I shared the gospel with sheep. It takes like Jesus. And oh. Paul planted a pile of water. God makes it. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm very glad you said that. Yeah, another key word here would be that is just being faithful, right? That successful evangelism is faithfully sharing the gospel. Um, I once heard someone say it this way, that it's, it's like the U.S. Postal Service, right? The U.S. Postal Service is successful when they deliver the mail. 
it's, it's not on them if you open that mail. <laughs> um, and so as, as faithful followers of Christ, it's on us to be faithfully handing out that gift, that package of, of the gospel, and trusting the Lord to work in their hearts as he wills, to open their hearts to receive it. So yes, that's, I'm, thank you for saying that. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to move move to the next one. I mean, honestly, each one of these deserve like a whole lesson on themselves, but I believe the next one on there is discipleship. <clears throat> right? Yes. So, same question. What comes to your mind when you hear the word discipleship? Partnership. Okay, yeah, can you explain that one? That's a very good start. Keep it rolling. What else? What else comes to your mind? Yes, Terry. Apprenticeship. Okay. Can you elaborate? Yeah, because somebody gets newly hired into a certain type of job or something, and they're taking that they're teamed up with somebody who is an expert at the at the what they do, uh -huh. and they get taught. They're trained. Yeah. And their their talents are nurtured and they're encouraged in their as they go on through the training process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, that's exactly how, I mean, if you just look at the life of Christ, right? And when we think about rabbis in, in the gospel, that what, what Jesus does is somewhat or, un, unordinary, but otherwise is ordinary, because he calls young men to follow him. Who, by the way, those disciples, I don't know what you picture in your mind when you picture some of those disciples. Sometimes with me, I mean, I grew up on flammographs. And the flannel, the flannel graphs show those disciples being fairly old, often. Do you realize that probably the oldest one was Peter? And he was probably like 20 years old. And that they think some of them, like maybe, um, uh, who's the one? John. Yeah, John, they think he's maybe like 14 or 15. So that they can consider as an adult as well. Yeah, yeah. So those... I mean, that's, that's pretty enlightening, isn't it? When you start thinking like Jesus apprenticeships or, or brings under his wing pretty young dudes <laughs> to change the world with. Those are not the people that we would have picked. And I'll, I'll probably be preaching on that next week because uh, next week in Luke, he calls all the, all the disciples. But man, that, that's fascinating to think about. Like, I mean, I have a daughter who's 17, and, <laughs> you know, like, like that's, that's, it's really, it's really something else. Oh, I really appreciate that. That was exactly what I was thinking. I mean, with friendship, and I think it might be, that's kind of the role that I'm in at my age, being in like a, hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't have all the knowledge yet, per se, as like your uh, mentor maybe being 20 years into a trade, but you're working alongside them, and they're sharpening you, and, and you're learning right. by doing it day in and day out. So I'm writing on the board that discipleship is both information and invitation. And so often we think discipleship is this. Because, well, I took a 13-week class on discipleship, right? And if you, if you read Matthew 28, when Jesus gives the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all the earth, the first thought that the disciples had was not like, man, I need to get into a 13-week class on discipleship, right? 
though they'd just been discipled or apprenticed or partnered for, for three years with Jesus, they had the information and the spirit was going to be given to them to continue to give the information. What they needed to do was imitate. All right? Did you have your hand up, Don? <laughs> Yeah, it's really good. Um, well, I see a crowd gathering out there, uh, so I think I think we are out of time. Um, we will push push the pause button there. Next week we'll wrap up with upward, inward, outward, and jump into lesson lesson three. But I appreciate you guys and digging in and the good thoughts. <clears throat>